Welcome back, everybody. Ready to dive into some more geopolitical deep waters with me today? Always ready to dive in. Today, yeah. we're looking at some really fascinating analysis of recent events in East Asia. Mm -hmm. You know, things with the U.S., right. China, Russia, North Korea, yeah, and even Japan and South Korea. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, the more we look at this stuff, yeah. the more it feels like the whole world is kind of holding its breath, right? Like, yeah. are we on the brink of something really big here, another major conflict? You know, it's interesting. Yeah. What's really striking is how all these events that seem kind of separate at first glance mm -hmm. are actually super intertwined. Yeah. It's like we're watching this super complex chess game play out. Oh, I like that. Where every single move huh. has these huge ripple effects across the whole board. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Yeah. Okay, so let's unpack this chessboard a little bit then. Sure. One move that has a lot of people on edge mm -hmm. is North Korea sending troops to Ukraine to fight alongside Russia. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a major escalation, right? What's your take on that? Oh, absolutely. It's a huge GE development, and it's drawn condemnation uh, from the G7, from NATO, right. and even South Korea, which is right there on the front lines, so to speak. Yeah. This move strengthens the Russian-North Korea alliance, of course. Right. But it also directly impacts South Korea's security, and that, by extension, uh -huh raises the risk of conflict right there on the Korean Peninsula. And it's not just talk, right? No, not at all. South Korea has actually summoned the Russian ambassador over this. Yeah. Demanding they pull those North Korean troops out of there. Mm -hmm. That seems like a pretty bold move, especially given how carefully they usually have to maneuver in that region. Yeah, you have to understand the bigger picture here. Okay. By sending troops to Ukraine, North Korea is gaining real-world combat experience. Uh -huh. Essentially, they're honing their military skills, right. and that poses a very direct threat to South Korea, which shares a border with them. Yeah, I can see that. And even more concerning is the potential for this to reignite the conflict on the Korean Peninsula. Right, right. Remember, the Korean War never officially ended. Oh, that's right. It's just an armistice. It's just a state of armistice, exactly. Wow. So with North Korea essentially entering this conflict with NATO involvement, wow. it really adds fuel to the fire yeah. and could very easily draw South Korea in alongside its allies. Like adding gasoline to an already smoldering fire. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And speaking of strategic moves, the U.S. hasn't exactly been sitting still either. Oh, no, not at all. They're rapidly upgrading airfields on those Pacific islands. Right. Specifically Tinian. Mm -hmm. And if anyone remember their history, yeah. Tinian played a huge E role in World War II. Right. It was the launching point for the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. Yeah. I mean, talk about heavy historical baggage. Right. So why Tinian? What's so important about it now? These upgrades are significant because they show a shift in U.S. military strategy in the Pacific. Okay. These revamped airfields, they're being called unsinkable aircraft carriers. Wow. Because of where they are and how resilient they are. I see. They're a key part of this, like, multi-layered strategy to counter China's growing military power, uh -huh. especially their increasingly sophisticated missile capabilities. So it's not just about having powerful weapons. Right. It, it's about being able to use them, even yeah. if you're under attack. Exactly. It's about having this network of strategic outposts all over this vast ocean. Precisely. And what's interesting is the U.S. is being pretty open about the challenges they're facing internally to do this. Mm -hmm. They're talking about bureaucracy, potentially even corruption. Yeah. Yeah slowing down these upgrades, which is surprisingly candid for a government, don't you think? It is. It is. And I, I think it shows they're trying to learn from past mistakes uh -huh. and be more transparent about the challenges they face. Yeah. Remember all those logistical nightmares we saw in past military operations? Ah, uh, for sure. This feels like a proactive attempt to avoid repeating those mistakes. Exactly. Because, you see, modern warfare, yeah. it's as much about logistics and industrial capacity as it is about having the latest weapons. It's like that saying, amateurs talk tactics, but professionals study logistics. Exactly. And this reminds me of the production race during World War II. Uh -huh. The side that could produce more and was more resilient ultimately had a huge E advantage. Yeah, that's a good point. The U.S., it seems, is taking that lesson to heart. So it's a race against time. It is. Not just to build up military capabilities, right. but to actually make sure those internal processes can function smoothly yeah. and sustain a long-term conflict if necessary. Exactly. And, you know, these airfields on Pacific islands, mm. it seems like a direct response to China's island building 
in the South China Sea. Oh, absolutely. It's a classic example of geopolitical maneuvering. It really highlights this shift in U.S. strategy, uh -huh. moving away from relying solely on aircraft carriers, which are vulnerable, right. towards a more distributed, more resilient force posture. So what's the big picture here? Well, We've got rising tensions in Europe, rising tensions in Asia, mm -hmm. the U.S. seemingly prepping for a possible two-front conflict. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we on the brink of another world war? It raises a very important question. What's that? Is this all just about military power, about strategic positioning, uh -huh. or is there something deeper going on? Like what? Like a clash of ideologies. Mm. You know, <laughs> the analysis we've been looking at definitely suggests it's not just a military chess match. Right. But a clash between these two totally different visions of how the world should work. Exactly. It's not just about territories and weapons. No. It's about ideas, about values, yeah. about how we organize ourselves as societies. Precisely. On one side, you have the U.S. and its allies who generally emphasize minimizing casualties, upholding human rights, adhering to international law. Right, right. And then, in contrast, you have China, Russia, and their allies, mm -hmm. who seem much more willing to sacrifice human life yeah. to disregard those principles in pursuit of their strategic goals. It's a pretty stark difference. <laughs> And it adds a whole other layer of complexity to the situation. Absolutely. <laughs> it makes predicting how things might unfold even more challenging. For sure. And it's not just ideology shaping this landscape, right? Yeah. Now. We also have to consider these rapidly advancing technologies. Oh, absolutely. The future of warfare is being rewritten right before our eyes. I mean, it feels like we're entering a whole new era of warfare. We are. One that's faster, more complex, and potentially even more devastating than anything we've seen before. It is. And understanding how these technologies will be used, how they'll be controlled, yeah, that's going to be critical in the years ahead. Okay, so we've laid out the rising tensions, the strategic moves by the key players. Mm -hmm. But before we jump to any conclusions, sure, let's take a closer look at the situation in the Pacific. Okay. Specifically, how the U.S. is preparing for a potential conflict with China over Taiwan. Right. I mean, that's arguably the most volatile flashpoint in the world right now. It's incredibly complex and very precarious, like a powder keg, really. Oh, wow. Any misstep could have global consequences. <laughs> but the Taiwan situation is complex because you've got this balance of power, historical grievances, economic interests, all tangled up. Sounds kind of like trying to defuse a bomb while juggling chainsaws. That's one way to put it. One wrong move and things could blow up, literally. So how's the U.S. approaching this? They must be feeling the heat from China. They're taking this, like, multi-pronged approach. Imagine a three-legged stool. Okay, I'm visualizing it. First leg, bolstering Taiwan's own defenses. Right. Giving them the weapons and training. So they can stand their ground if things go south. Exactly. Second leg, strengthening alliances. Japan, South Korea, Australia, like a neighborhood watch. Gotcha. Safety in numbers. And the third leg. Making it crystal clear to China, any forceful move on Taiwan means swift and decisive consequences. So deterrence. Basically saying, don't even think about it. Right. But does that actually work? China seems pretty set on Taiwan no matter what. That's the million dollar question. Deterrence only works if the other side believes you'll follow through. And China's been getting pretty assertive lately exercises near Taiwan, tough talk about reunification. Yeah, it's like they're testing the waters, seeing how far they can push. A high-stakes poker game. Mm. And it's not just military, right? Taiwan's a tech giant. Absolutely. Huge semiconductor producer. Those tiny chips, they're in everything. Phones to fighter jets. So a conflict messes up global supply chains. We're talking economic chaos worldwide. Like cutting off the world's tech oxygen supply. So it's not just about armies. It's about who controls the global economy's arteries. Exactly. And China knows they've got economic leverage. They control a lot of those rare earth minerals. Those things that are essential for all sorts of high-tech industries. Yep. They could use that to pressure the U.S. and its allies. So it's like chess. But instead of taking pieces, you're crippling the other guy's whole economy. Great analogy. It shows this isn't just nations fighting. It's systems. The U.S., Democratic, capitalist versus China and Russia. More authoritarian, state-controlled. Right. It's like two different operating systems battling it out for dominance. Wow. And the outcome shapes the whole world order. U.S.-led or a multipolar world with China and Russia leading the charge. And will the Internet stay free and open? Or will it become fragmented, controlled by authoritarian regimes? Big questions. Absolutely. We don't have a crystal ball. 
but what we've been looking at suggests the world's at a crossroads. Choices made now affect everything in the 21st century. No doubt about that. The stakes have never been higher. We've talked tensions, strategic moves, potential conflicts. But let's not forget the human cost of all this. Behind the headlines, it's real people whose lives are on the line. You're right. We get caught up in the geopolitical calculations and forget it's about real people. Soldiers, civilians, families torn apart. They're the true casualties. Easy to get lost in analyzing the chess moves and forget that. It's crucial to remember. So what can we do? We have to exhaust all options for peaceful resolutions. Diplomacy, dialogue, common ground, those are the tools we need. Recognizing our interconnectedness, that's key too. Absolutely. And it's not just governments and diplomats, it's on all of us. So. Challenging warmongering, yep. seeking diverse views, having those tough conversations. Exactly. We can all contribute to a more peaceful and just world. It's a reminder that we're not just watching this unfold. We're active participants. Our choices matter. Every single one. Back to East Asia, things are getting serious. The U.S. seems committed to defending Taiwan while China's determined to take it. A real tinderbox. It is. And a big factor is logistics and production. Can the U.S. actually back up their tough talk with the resources and industrial muscle for a long fight? Good point. And they've admitted there are problems with bureaucracy, possible corruption, slowing things down. Trying to address it, but we'll see if it's enough. Like turning a giant ship takes time and coordination. And China. Massive industry. But they've got vulnerabilities too, right? Of course. Supply chains relying on global trade, shrinking workforce. Like a giant with feet of clay. Exactly. So it's this battle of strengths and weaknesses, each side trying to outmaneuver and outproduce the other. Industrial chess. With okay. factories and supply chains as the pieces. And that brings up this fascinating idea. Distributed warfare. It challenges the traditional model of big armies clashing head on. Distributed warfare. Sounds almost sci-fi. It's about spreading out forces and assets, making them harder to hit and more resilient. Not putting all your eggs in one basket. Right. Flexibility and adaptability are key. The U.S. is doing this with their unsinkable aircraft carriers in the Pacific. So not just bigger bombs, but a more adaptable force that can handle unpredictable situations. Exactly. And this is where tech gets really important. AI, drones, cyber warfare. Changing the whole game. They enhance awareness, coordinate attacks, disrupt communications. Like a swarm of bees, individually small, but collectively powerful. Drones, AI making decisions, cyber attacks. It's both amazing and kind of scary. It raises big ethical questions too. <clears throat> How do we make sure these autonomous weapons don't make mistakes? How do we protect people from cyber attacks on critical infrastructure? Playing a high stakes game with rules that are still being written. Exactly, and the consequences of getting it wrong could be devastating. That's why these conversations are so important. We need to be proactive, shaping this future, not just reacting to it. Absolutely, knowledge is power, but only if we use it wisely. Right, let's shift gears to the ideological dimension of this. That clash of values between the U.S. and China, it's a battle for hearts and minds as much as anything else. Two very different visions of the future competing. The U.S. and its allies with democracy, individual freedom, rule of law. And China and Russia leaning towards authoritarianism, state control, a more top-down approach. A clash between liberalism and authoritarianism, individualism and collectivism. And it's not just on battlefields. It's in the realm of ideas, information, culture this global competition for influence. Each side using propaganda, disinformation, soft power to push their agenda, like an ideological chess game. It's about winning hearts and minds shaping narratives. Ultimately, it's about who gets to write the rules for the 21st century. And that's where media, education, civil society come in, promoting critical thinking, media literacy, empowering individuals to make informed decisions. Fostering cross-cultural understanding, building bridges, finding common ground. Mm -hmm. We're all part of the same human family. Exactly, because preventing a catastrophic conflict starts with creating a world where it's unthinkable. Where dialogue and diplomacy are the norm. And we all have a part to play in that. Let's look at the human stories within all of this. You're right. Real people's lives are being shaped by these events. We found a story about a young woman from Taiwan facing a tough choice. Stay on the island and risk getting caught in a conflict or leave her home and family for safety. A heartbreaking dilemma that many are facing right now. A powerful reminder that even with these huge geopolitical shifts, it's the individual stories that matter most.
stories of courage, resilience, searching for peace in difficult times, they're the stories that should inspire us. So true. They inspire us to work towards a future where those tough choices aren't necessary. Exactly. And that brings up a crucial question. What can we as individuals do in this complicated situation? It's easy to feel overwhelmed, like our actions are too small to matter. But I believe even small acts of courage, compassion, understanding can make a difference. Creating positive change. Starts with educating ourselves, seeking different viewpoints, stepping outside our comfort zones. Respectful dialogue, challenging stereotypes, advocating for peace, speaking up against injustice, building bridges across divides. Remembering our shared humanity. We may have differences, but we all want the same basic things. Safety, justice, prosperity, we all share that responsibility to work towards those goals. Well said. Let's talk about the role of technology in all of this. This is where innovation and geopolitics really collide. It's an era of incredible technological advancement. And those advancements are changing the balance of power, the nature of war itself. Like a tech arms race, everyone wants the edge. Absolutely. We've seen AI being used to develop autonomous weapon systems, raising ethical questions about machines making life or death decisions. Like science fiction becoming a reality. And cyber warfare is becoming a major tool, mm. disrupting infrastructure, stealing information, even influencing elections, a whole new invisible battlefield. A shadowy world of espionage and sabotage where the rules are constantly changing and the stakes are incredibly high. And we're just starting to grasp its implications, still figuring out the ethics, the laws, the strategies. It's like we're playing a game with rules that are still being written. And that uncertainty makes it even more dangerous. We don't know how these technologies will be used, how they'll reshape the world. Stepping into uncharted territory. Potential for progress, but also for catastrophe. Absolutely. We need to ensure these technologies are used for good, not for harm. Clear ethical guidelines, international norms, and regulations are crucial. Open and honest conversations about the risks are crucial, too. We can't ignore this and hope for the best. Right. We have to shape the future of technology, not just react to it. The future of humanity might depend on that. It very well might. We can create a future where technology serves us, not the other way around. Okay, let's step back and look at what we've learned today. We covered the tensions in East Asia, the role of tech, the clash of ideologies, it's a lot to take in. And we explored the human stories, the cost of conflict, the importance of peace. So what does all this mean for us? What can we do in this uncertain world? How can we make a difference? We're not powerless. We can all contribute to peace, understanding, and responsible innovation. Our actions matter. Educate ourselves. Engage in dialogue. Advocate for policies that put people first. Mm -hmm. Support organizations working for peace. Amplify the voices of those working for a better future. Because the future isn't set in stone. It's something we create together. We can choose hope over fear, cooperation over conflict, peace over war. Let's choose wisely. You know, we've been focused on all the immediate players and their moves. Right. But what about the bigger picture? Mm. What's driving this whole global shift toward conflict? Yeah. It feels like something bigger is going on, mm. like some kind of undercurrent pulling us toward a confrontation. That's really insightful, actually. Oh. It, it takes us beyond just the day-to-day -day headlines yeah. into those deeper historical trends and those long-term cycles. Mm -hmm. And one idea that really helps explain this is the concept of hegemonic transition. Okay, hegemonic transition. Yeah. Not a term I hear every day. No. Nah. Break that down for me. Okay, so basically it refers to the process of how one dominant global power, the hegemon, is challenged and eventually replaced by another. Okay. Think of it like the changing of the guard, but on a global scale. Wow. Well. Throughout history, you see these cycles of rise and fall uh -huh. with new empires and nations emerging to challenge the existing world order. So are you saying we're in the middle of one of these transitions right now? Well. With the U.S., the current, I guess, hegemon mm -hmm. being challenged by these rising powers like China and Russia. There's a lot of evidence pointing that way. Mm. I mean, China's economic growth has been phenomenal. It has. And they're definitely translating that economic power into military power and global influence. Right. It's like they're playing the long game, yeah. building their strength, waiting for the right moment. And Russia. Russia. Well, they've got their internal struggles. Yeah. But they still have a massive nuclear arsenal. That's true. And they're not afraid to use their power on the world stage. Right. So it's a potent combination that's really shaking things mm -hmm. up. It's almost like the tectonic plates of global power are shifting under our feet. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Creating instability 
and setting the stage for some major eruptions. Right. So can we manage this peacefully mm. or are we headed for some kind of catastrophic collision? That's the big question. Yeah. These transitions are rarely smooth. Right. They often involve these periods of intense competition, friction, even conflict. Like two powerful magnets pushing each other away. Exactly. The closer they get, the stronger the force pushing them apart. Which brings us back to that very real possibility of conflict in East Asia, mm -hmm. maybe even a wider global conflict. Yeah. The stakes are just incredibly high. They are. And the consequences of miscalculation are terrifying. There's no doubt about it. So what can we do? Well... Can we prevent this clash of titans? It's tough. Is there a way to coexist peacefully? Well... Or are we just doomed to repeat the same cycles of history over and over again? It's a tough question. Yeah. There are no easy answers, no guarantees. Right. But understanding those historical patterns, uh -huh. recognizing the forces at play, yeah. and fostering open and honest dialogue, okay. those are essential first steps. We see. Like trying to steer a ship through a storm. Oh, I like that. You need to understand the weather patterns, mm -hmm. a steady hand on the wheel, okay, and the willingness to adjust course as needed. It's about moving beyond that zero-sum game mentality, right? Exactly. Where one side winning means the other side automatically loses. Yeah. We got to find ways to work together. Right. To create win-win situations for everyone involved. We're facing common threats. Like what? Climate change, uh -huh. pandemics, yeah. economic instability. Right. These things cross national borders. Yeah. They don't care about our political differences. Absolutely. And tackling them effectively yeah. requires collaboration, not confrontation. Working together. Right. Building bridges. Okay. Creating incentives for cooperation. Like. And recognizing that we're all in this together. It sounds like a monumental task. It is. But an absolutely vital one. It is. We can't let fear and mistrust lead us down a dangerous path. That's right. We have to choose hope. Yes. Choose dialogue. Uh-huh. Choose cooperation. We do. You know, it's like you said earlier, mm -hmm. we it, it, humans have this amazing capacity for reason. We do. For empathy, for cooperation. Yeah. We just got to find the will and the courage to actually use those qualities. That's right. Even when we're scared, even when the future seems uncertain. It's time to step back from the brink mm -hmm. and chart a new course for humanity. I love it. One based on mutual respect, mm -hmm. share prosperity, okay. and a real commitment to peace. That's a powerful message. It is. And one we need to hear right now. I agree. We've covered so much today. We have. The tensions, the potential for conflict, the forces driving it all. Yeah, it's complex. But it's essential information for anyone trying to make sense of the world today. I think so. And like you said, mm -hmm. we all have a role to play in shaping the future. We do. Our choices matter. Yeah. Our voices matter. Mm -hmm. Our actions matter. They do. Let's choose wisely. Let's choose peace. Let's choose a future where cooperation wins and hope triumphs over fear. I couldn't agree more. And on that note, that's a wrap for this episode of The Deep Dive. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And as always, keep those critical thinking caps on.